No, you can't? Yes, I can share it now. Okay. Is it a good view? Yes, clear. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, we can start it now. You can see this on the screen. Some crash course in oncology therapy. Can you see this on the screen? Dr. Inas, yes, can you doctor. see this on the screen? Okay, yes, excellent. Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good evening to everyone. And uh, we'll begin our first uh, uh, session with uh, oncology uh, chemotherapy, uh, pharmacology of onco uh, uh, oncology chemotherapy and the target therapy. The first part is by me, which is the pharmacology of the chemotherapeutic agents. And second uh, lecture will be by Dr. Noura. Uh, she'll talk about uh, target chemotherapy. You know, uh, we are typically teaching uh, chemotherapy, pharmacology, to oncology, uh, oncology fellow physicians and uh, in the university, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, bulk of knowledge uh, uh, that we learn and that we have to deliver in chemotherapy pharmacology and target uh, therapy pharmacology is really immense and we need tens and dozens of these kind of lectures actually to complete uh, pharmacology of chemotherapy agents. Okay, so these are my objectives. Uh, we'll define the important terminologies uh, related to intent and types of chemotherapy and cell cycle concepts. Uh, we'll try to talk about uh, the body surface area concept for dosing and neoplastic agents. Um, this is uh, this is different uh, kind of concept actually when we apply the dosing concept for the anti neoplastic agents. Um, We'll try to illustrate some of the mechanism of actions of major classes of chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy uh, and Dr. Noura will talk about the targeted agents. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll describe the indications of any neoplastic agents, and uh, we'll tr try to, to uh, address some of the most common uh, side effects uh, and unique toxicities of the any neoplastic agent. Of course, it's not possible to cover the entire scope of the uh, chemotherapy uh, pharmacology in 45 minutes. Uh, we'll try to finish it as soon as uh, uh, we have been assigned to finish in 45 minutes. So let's try to, uh, to, try to understand what is the cancer, what is the, what is the word cancer means, which is sertan. So this is, you know, in our body, cells are multiplying all the time. Uh, for example, bone marrow cells, mucosal cell line cells, rapidly dividing cells. But sometimes what happens due to mutation or due to whatever mechanism, cell starts uh, to uh, divide in an abnormal fashion. And uh, that can result into tumor, which could be malignant tumor, which could be benign tumor. If it is malignant tumor, it's called cancer. The cancer cells actually, uh, they can spread to the other parts of the body, to the blood, the vessels, or the lymph, uh, lymphatic system, and that process is called metastasis in solid tumors, and this process is called infiltration in case of uh, leukemias. We have to also understand some other important definitions. Um, uh, because the chemotherapy is cytotoxic. It's not only cytotoxic to uh, cancer cells, but it's also cytotoxic to healthy cells. So therefore, we have to give ample amount of time for the healthy cells to regenerate. And at the same time, we should not give uh, rest to the cancer cells. So we have to uh, give chemotherapy at the regular interval, at appropriate interval, typically every three weeks. Or sometimes some chemotherapies are given every two weeks. Some other chemotherapies are given every four weeks. Chemotherapy, as I mentioned, uh, it is cytotoxic, so it is associated with significant uh, side effects. Uh, before 1990, some patients having curable diseases, they were, they were actually refusing to take chemotherapy because of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. One of my uh, colleagues will talk about chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting as a separate lecture. So after the development of the novel antibiotics, uh, people were able to tolerate the side effects of chemotherapy. Some chemotherapies can cause bone marrow suppression, neutropenia, infections, mucositis. So what we try to do, we give the antidotes, for example, with methotrexate, we combine liquorine, we give antibiotics, we give hydration to prevent the nephrotoxicity, uh, for example, in case of methotrexate. So the combination of uh, the, uh, the chemotherapy uh, medications along with uh, these supportive care medication is actually called supportive therapy. So we have to support the patient with the supportive uh, care therapy in order to minimize the side effects of the chemotherapy. 
you might have heard about chemotherapy protocol uh, in the university. So chemotherapy protocol is uh, basically it's a regimen uh, which may contain one or more than one chemotherapeutic agents or um, chemotherapy plus targeted therapy therapeutic agents, and plus it also contains uh, uh, the supportive care therapy. So it's a complete set of uh, uh, treatment regimen which is. Uh, a design to treat a certain malignancy and of course uh, this chemotherapy protocol is evidence-based either it had been tested in phase two clinical trial or phase three clinical trials this is an example of a chemotherapy protocol uh, in which uh, two chemotherapy agents are, are combined in this protocol doxorubicin which is also called adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Doxorubicin is an anthracycline in a, and cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent. So this protocol is called AC protocol, A for adriamycin, C for cyclophosphamide. The dose of doxorubicin is 60 milligram per meter square is given IP push uh, over 15 to 30 minutes and cyclophosphamide is 600 milligram per meter square. This is uh, what I was talking to you and I will talk to you in a couple of minutes. What is the body surface area concept? So we have to calculate the body surface area in order to, for example, if the body surface area of the patient is two, then the doxorubicin dose, the final dose will be 120 milligram, 60 times two will be 120 milligram total dose. And the chemotherapy protocol tells you the administration guidelines. It also uh, tells you about the, the supportive care therapies. It also tells you, for example, the patient has hematological toxicities, neutropenia, so how much dose we should reduce. So all these sets of information is actually called chemotherapy protocol. We have more than 500 chemotherapy protocol in our uh, area software library, which we are using for different solid tumors and, and uh, hematological uh, malignancies. So, uh, uh, for the diagnosis of the cancer, um, typically a patient present with certain specific signs and symptoms. For example, a patient having leukemia will present with signs of infection, signs of uh, uh, due to neutropenia, and patient may present with, uh, um, uh, with fatigue, and that can be typically due to anemia. And uh, some patients may have bruises and ecchymosis, and that could be due to thrombocytopenia uh, due to le uh, le leukemia. So when the patient presents with these kind of symptoms, so the physician will do the complete blood count, and that tells you that this complete blood count is not normal, and then that will uh, followed by the tissue diagnosis, so bone marrow biopsy, if it's a solid tumor, again, the tissue diagnosis, if there's lymph node disease, again, the tissue diagnosis. So tissue diagnosis which is biopsy, is essential to start the treatment. We have a quiz, actually, which will be followed in a couple of minutes. So the tissue diagnosis is essential to start the treatment. Why? Because sometimes the tissue diagnosis, which is done in an outside hospital, when you do it in your hospital, it, it may change. So it, ha it happened many times, more than 10 times I've witnessed it, actually, the tissue diagnosis has been changed. So uh, we should not start the treatment until the tissue diagnosis is established. Um, there are different tumor markers. You can see the breast cancer, CA125, CEA, which can be also elevated in case of uh, stomach cancer, in case of colon cancer. There are a variety of different tumor markers. However, these are not specific to one uh, particular malignancy. So you cannot start the treatment based on the tumor markers and based on the presenting signs and symptoms. You have to have the tissue diagnosis in order to start the treatment. And once you have the tissue diagnosis, then you have to stage the disease. For example, if it's a solid tumor, then we use TNM classification. Just we try to use uh, in a simple way. The T stands for the size of the tumor, um, which I'm not going to go into the complexities of the size of the tumor. So uh, that typically tells you how much is the size of the tumor and the number of the lymph nodes involved. This is the nodal involvement. And M stands for the metastasis. So, for example, if the disease has spread to the other parts of the body, that means that the disease has metastasized. So typically, um, uh, for example, if we talk about the breast cancer, so stage one and two is early breast cancer, and stage three will be local regional spread of the disease. And stage four is the disease uh, where the disease has spread to the other parts of the body. So typically, in stage one and two, and up to three, our uh, aim is to cure the patient from the malignancy. And in stage four disease in solid tumors, most of the solid tumors, our aim is to 
reduce the symptoms of the disease and we use palliative intent chemotherapy unless we have uh, uh, hematological malignancies such as uh, lymphoma, even in stage four disease, uh, the intent of the chemotherapy is curative. So this is what I was referring to. So uh, leukemias, lymphomas, testicular cancer, gem cell tumors, nasopharyngeal carcinomas, these are the tumors uh, where we are trying to use curative intent. And also the early stage uh, breast cancer are even the stage three breast cancer, colon cancers, early stage colon cancer, stage one, two, and three. So these are the examples actually where we are trying to use curative intent chemotherapy. Our aim is to achieve cure whether we achieve this with chemotherapy or with surgery or with combination of chemotherapy and surgery or combination of chemotherapy and surgery, the radiation, our aim is cure. And as I mentioned in stage four disease or in advanced disease, our aim is palliative or in those leukemia patients who are not responding to the frontline therapies and they're not, they're not candidate for other intensive uh, uh, treatment options such as bone marrow transplant. So the uh, intent of the chemotherapy in those patients uh, will be only palliative. We have to understand some other terminologies, what is new adjuvant therapy and adjuvant therapy. So let's take an example of the breast cancer. If the patient has stage one and two disease or on stage three disease, and stage three disease, the size of the tumor is bigger, and we would like to reduce the size of the tumor to make it surgically resectable. And uh, uh, after giving like four to six cycles of chemotherapy, which is called neoadjuvant uh, therapy, we can reduce the size of the tumor, and the surgeons can easily manipulate and do the surgery. And actually, in uh, 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 in uh, to new positive breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer, what we have noticed around 50 to 60 percent of the patients when they receive neoadjuvant therapy, uh, they will be uh, uh, free from the tumor at the time when they are taken to the OR for the surgery. So that's called pathological complete response. And also some uh, female patient, they would like to have the breast conservation surgery, they would like to have the minimally invasive surgery and for that reason, uh, we use the uh, neoadjuvant therapy in order to reduce the size of the tumor and to make it, uh, to to, in order to minimize the area of the surgery, and that really helps in the breast conservation surgery and the reconstruction of the breast. And adjuvant therapy is actually defined as therapy which is followed by the mainstay of the treatment. For example, in breast cancer, the, uh, the curative treatment option is surgery. So surgery will remove the tumor. And after the surgery, uh, we would like to give certain type of therapy, chemotherapy, uh, or also target therapy can be used as adjuvant therapy uh, in order to minimize uh, uh, the micrometastatic disease coming back. So in order to prevent the relapse, actually, uh, or the recurrence, we use the adjuvant therapy. There are some other uh, terminologies, particularly in pathological malignancies. Uh, for example, induction therapy is actually used in acute leukemia in order to induce remission in acute lymphocytic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, uh, consolidation therapy, uh, which uh, means uh, to consolidate the remission. For example, the patient is in a state which is free from the leukemia. We would like to consolidate this remission state. Uh, consolidation means, I think, Madhut in Arabic. <clears throat> we would like to make this consolidation stronger. I mean, we would like to make this remission state uh, stronger and lasting longer. Uh, and uh, for that reason, we have to give intensive chemotherapy after the patient has achieved complete remission. And in some kind of acute leukemia, such as uh, acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia and some subtypes of the acute minor leukemia, such as acute myelocytic leukemia, we provide a maintenance chemotherapy over the period of two to three years in smaller doses in order to prevent the cancer coming back or leukemia coming back. So now we move to the first question. Um, and uh, you can scan this code in order to answer the question. And that is the question, which one of the following diagnostic method is essential to start chemotherapy? Option A, sign and symptom. Option B, tissue diagnosis. Option C, tumor markers. And option D, is strong family history. Dr. Ines, if you can coordinate. We can we can wait yes, I guess okay. we can I will share it. I will share my screen and they will see the question okay sure, sure, sure. can you see the question 
So please answer the questions by enter uh, menti.com. Excellent. I think we, sh we have uh, received so far 16 responses only of the 100. It's too little number of responses. 23, uh, Yalla, speed up. Speed up, we need at least 33%. Come on, come on, come on. So I think we can close the poll because uh, it has been more than a minute. Can we close the poll? Okay, the question number two is, what is the main goal of the treatment in early stage breast cancer? Very good, we have 21 responses. Excellent. We received 40 responses, 44, very good. Yeah, that means uh, most of the people are actively participating. That's good. 54 responses. Excellent. Sixty-four responses. Excellent. And we close the poll now. Okay. Can you share your screen now? Sure. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I think most of you have replied. Uh, question number one, tissue diagnosis, and that's correct. You cannot start the treatment based on silent symptoms and tumor markers, a strong family history. So the tissue diagnosis is essential to start the treatment. That was the correct answer. And option, uh, sorry. Uh, the question number two, uh, the D is the correct option because in early stage breast cancer, the, our intent is curative. So I think more than 80% people have uh, uh, chosen this answer, which is the right answer, curative intent. Thank you so much for your attention. Now let's try to understand the body surface area concept. So most of the chemotherapeutic agents that we are using, actually we have to uh, dose them either based on the body surface area or per kilogram. So most common body surface area formula which is used in clinical practice uh, everywhere is the Mostler's formula. Mostler's formula is uh, uh, equal to weight in kilogram and height in centimeters. And you divide it with 3600 and you take the whole under root. So if you have the weight and height of the patient, then you have to divide it with 3600, then in your, in your calculators, take the whole under root. And after you take the under root, which is called chisel, uh, you take the two, that's the two digits after the decimal point. For example, if it is 1.7, 1 1.734, so you will only take 1.73, okay? And no need to round it up, round it down, okay? Just take first two digits after the decimal without doing any rounding.
Uh, average BSA um, is around 1.73, but in our population, we have mainly obese patient population, and most of the patients that I've seen in uh, leukemia, in like hematological malignancies, their BSA is around two. And in solid tumor, some malignancies, their BSA might be low because of uh, patients are cachectic or underweight. So now you're gonna use this formula, and I have a question here. And again, Dr. Ines will share her screen with you to see the question. Dr. Ines? Yes, this is the question. Yeah, I think we are running out of time, so we need to do it a little bit quickly. Even if we have the 10 responses, that's fine. I think it needs a lot of calculations, so perhaps it's a little bit difficult, maybe. We didn't receive any response so far. Whether right or wrong, there is no response yet, so that needs mathematics, actually, calculation. I think uh, nobody would like to answer because it's really too difficult. Uh, okay, uh, we went. I think we went to this question. It's uh, it's actually it was not quite at this point. Uh, we need to go there first. Actually, if I can share my screen now. Okay. So basically 1.76 meter is the right answer. Uh, now we have to understand the cell cycle concept and the site of the, mecha the, site of the mechanism of uh, action. So this is a, a human cell, um, our healthy cell, and the cancer cell also follows the same pattern uh, when it, um, uh, I mean, for the cell replication. So G1 phase is basically a uh, uh, preparatory phase for the S phase where the DNA actually DNA synthesis takes place. During the G1 phase, the protein and enzyme which are required for the DNA synthesis actually takes place. In the S phase, actually the DNA synthesis takes place. In G2 phase, there's a preparatory course for the mitosis to take place and uh, these um, enzymes and proteins uh, which are helpful in the uh, mitosis actually that takes place in the G2 phase and in M phase actually the mitos actual mitosis takes place where the uh, um, parent cell is divided into two progeny cells. So you can see there are different drugs acting on different uh, uh, cell, cell uh, cycle phases like steroids and asparaginase and G1. A lot of anti-metabolites are working on S phase. We have etoposidolomycin working on G2 phase. We have many vinca alkaloids and taxanes working on mitosis uh, phase, M phase. And the G0 is the resting phase. So many medications are chemotherapeutic agents are cell cycle specific agents that mean that they are they are exerting their effect on a specific part of the cell cycle and that's why we're trying to arrange um, in a chemotherapy i mean we try to use different chemotherapeutic agents uh, in a chemotherapy protocol from the different mechanism of action so they can target different parts of the cell cycle in order to have um, pharmacodynamic synergy but uh, minimize uh, in order to have uh, lesser toxicities some chemotherapies are not uh, cell cycle specific agents, for example, alkylating agents. And targeted therapies, Dr. Nora will talk about that, and they, they accept their effects on specific tumor. So these are the classes that we're going to go over. Uh, we have first class alkylating agents. There are subclasses, nitrogen mustard. We have mycorrhythamine. Uh, we are not using uh, mycorrhythamine anymore. Uh, cyclophosphamide, ifosamide, melphalan, benamastine, cisplatinum, carboplatinum, oxide platinum. We have all these uh, alkylating agents under the nitrogen mustard available in our formulary except the mycorrhythamine. From the nitrous, urea, carmistine, lomastine, uh, streptosin, docarbazine, procarbazine, timozolamide, we are using all of these medications except the streptosin. We'll talk about them one by one uh, in details. And then we have ethylene imines, uh, which is tiotiba, and we have alkyl, sulfone, and bucilfen. We are using all these uh, alkylating agents uh, in our hospital. And and anybody actually a big college center, they must be using all these alkylating agents uh, in their hospital. We're not except mycorrhythamine and streptosin. 
then we have anti metabolites, uh, uh, sorry, anti microtubule um, uh, agents. Uh, we have uh, two different types of the anti microtubule agents. We have wind calcolites and taxanes. So, wind calcolites are wind blasting, wind pristine, and venolabine, and taxanes are those taxol, paclitaxel, and tabazitaxel. Arabulin is pretty similar to the taxin, but it's not classified under the taxins. Then third class is topoisomerase inhibitors. We have topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which cut one side of the double helix, and the topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, which cut the two sides of the double helix. We'll talk about them in details. Um, and then we have anti-metabolites. Um, uh, it's another big group of chemotherapeutic agents. We have uh, methotrexate, pamitrexate under the folate antagonist. We have purine analogs, cladribine, fludarabine, mercaptopurine, and tioglanine. And we, in uh, under the pyrimidine analogs, we have capecitabine, cytarabine, fivefluorouracil, and gemcitabine. We have all these medications available in our formulary to manage different malignancies. And then we have some hormonal agents, uh, like glutamide, glutamide, um, and we have LHRH analogs, say, luprolide, vazelin, and digarlis. They don't want to talk about CDK4, 16 inhibitor. I some of you will talk about that. We have anti-estrogen, tamoxifen, magistral, acetate, and we have abiraterone and enzalutamide. I guess Dr. Nora will talk about them. We have aromatase inhibitors, letrozole and estrozole and axiomestin. And there are some miscellaneous agents, just yes, asparaginase, or arsenic trioxide, which is zernic, and some poison, but we use it in small doses uh, for, for APL. All transgenic acids, dactylomycin, bluomycin, we have all these agents available in our formulary uh, to treat different kinds of malignancies. So now let's begin with the pharmacology of the alkylating agents. Um, so alkylating agents, they uh, typically make uh, an um, active moiety of ethylenium ammonium compounds, uh, which bind with the N7 atom of the guanosine, and that is responsible for 90% of the alkylation in the DNA. I think Dr. Innes and the SOFA administrator will share with you my slides and everybody's slides, so you can go through the detail because of the paucity of time. I'll try to uh, go over the slides quickly. So because of this alkylation, uh, the cytotoxic effect uh, can happen by inhibition of the DNA replication and transcription. There could be mispairing of the DNA, and that results in this track breakage as well. So what is the dose-limiting toxicity? Dose-limiting toxicity typically is a toxicity which happens in two out of three patients. by grade 4 toxicity, a 2 out of 6 patients, grade 4 toxicity. Grade 4 toxicity is a severe toxicity, and uh, it uh, in both finding uh, studies in the clinical trial in smaller cohorts of 3 patients, and 3 plus 3 design patients. So they try to increase the dose and see the toxicity. And if this toxicity happened, 2 out of 6 a two out of three patients, then that is called those limiting toxicity. And what the clinical trial is do that they try to go one step down, and that is called the maximum tolerated dose. And each drug or a group is known for its uh, dose limiting toxicity. For alkylating agents, the dose limiting toxicity is is bone marrow expression, uh, particularly in neutropenia. And for um, carboplatin, for example, it's particularly thrombocytopenia. Other toxicities: the nausea and vomiting, alopecia. Um, uh, common uh, toxicities of the alkylating agent, but that happens after a longer period of time to so those patients who had received alkylating agents. You may see secondary leukemia like AML up to 10, 15 years, and that typically you see in the survivors of the adult uh, childhood leukemias. Uh, in contrast to the anthracycline, uh, uh, topoisomerase 2 induced secondary leukemia that may happen typically in shorter course of time, like within a year or within two years. Okay, so that is the metabolism of the cyclophosphamide, which is uh, one of the prototype of the alkylating agents. So basically, you need an active uh, liver uh, in order to metabolize uh, cyclophosphamide through the P450 uh, cytochrome enzyme system into 4-hydroxycyclophosphamide that is converted to aldophosphamide. Uh, 
and aldofosfamide is converted to acrolein and phosphoramide most of Acrolein is responsible for one of the key uh, common toxicity of the alkylating uh, of the um, uh, cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide, and that is hemorrhagic cystitis. It binds with the wall of the bladder and produces hemorrhagic cystitis. So what we do basically, we give an antidote, it's called mercaptoid and sulfonate sodium, or it's called mesna. So we always combine mesna with iophosphamide and higher doses of the cyclophosphamide in order to prevent hemorrhagic cystitis, and that is one of the question MCQ coming, question number four. And phosphoramide mustard, and that is the key component, an active metabolite, which actually uh, alkylate the N7 atom of equinocene and responsible for the fatal toxicity uh, from the cycle of phosphoramide. So the key message, take home message, the acrolein is one of the uh, toxic metabolites which can cause hemorrhagic system. Cystitis, and we have to give mesna in order to prevent uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. So, supportive care part, in it, whenever we use the iphosphamide, will be to combine it with the mesna or with the higher dose of the cyclophosphamide. We have to use mesna along with it. Okay, so there are some um, uh, unique side effects um, uh, and clinical uses of different cyclophosphamide is used for a variety of indications, and iphosphamide also used for a variety of indications. There's a common um, Side effects, hemorrhagic cystitis, between uh, cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. For that reason, we have to give them mesna, and we have to counsel the patient to take enough amount of fluids uh, if they're drinking orally, and they need to wipe immediately. They go to the washroom and wipe immediately because if the urine is uh, staying in the bladder and that is having more and more acrolein, that causes the hemorrhagic cystitis. Okay, there are some other side effects. Uh, bone marrow suppression, which is common for all of them, and we're not going to talk about that. And uh, uh, sciata is also common with the cyclophosphamide, particularly when it's taken with the venous. Melphalan um, uh, can cause myelin suppression, nausea, vomiting, and of course, uh, all these alkali negatives can cause bone marrow suppression, as we mentioned that here, those are the toxicity of the bone marrow suppression. Cisplatinum is uh, nephrotoxic as well as neurotoxic, so we have to give ample amount of fluids before and after the cisplatinum, and we have to give magnesium and uh, potassium before and after the cisplatinum because uh, it can cause significant uh, hypomagnesemia and uh, hypokalemia. And for carboplatinum, we have to use a specific formula, formula that's called Calvert formula, and where you use the target AUC, which is the area of the curve, the bio, the, um, and uh, you assume the bioavailability of the of platinum by using the different AUC factor, which is from 4 to 7.5, typically up to 8 as well. So patients who are going for curative intent, for example, ovarian cancer, you can start them with 7.5 AUC. And most of the people actually use the AUC of 6 for ovarian cancer. And if you're using uh, palliative chemotherapy, you can use the AUC of 4. For a salvage kind of regimen like ice or rice protocol, you use AUC5. So you basically take the AUC, whatever the oncologist decides, and you calculate the correct clearance by the Cochrane Gauss equation and add 25 to it and multiply one this. And the maximum correct clearance that we can use is 125 ml per minute. If it is more than that, you just round it to 125 ml per minute. Okay. So uh, the side effect of the cisplatinum we mentioned, like cisplatinum is uh, very well known to, amito, uh, to be amelogenic, is a highly amelogenic therapeutic agent. And uh, uh, it's a prototype of the drug. When we talk about uh, amelogenicity, the first drug that comes in our mind is the cisplatinum. It, uh, it can cause terrible nausea and vomiting, and that's why you have to use three drug or four drug combination based on the new ASCO and ANSYS guidelines enough to prevent the nausea and vomiting most of the the venom is nephrotoxic and myelosuppressive and autotoxic as well. It can cause peripheral neuropathy. Carboplatinum as uh, is myelosuppression is typically chromosarapenia, uh, but its incidence of nephrotoxicity is lesser. Incidence of the nephrotoxicity with the exoplatinum is even more lesser. Uh, and uh, nausea and vomiting of the carboplatinum um, uh, is actually according to the new guidelines. Uh, uh, carboplatinum, uh, when you're using the AUC of five or more than five, it is highly emetogenic. 
For oxalic platin, is uh, uh, the most common side effect is actually uh, laryngeal spasm, um, uh, laryngeal pharyngeal spasm, especially when they are exposed to cold. So there's two different kinds of neurotoxicity: early onset, which is mainly due to cold-induced uh, laryngeal spasm, and the uh, chronic, which develops over time after uh, after the exposure of the oxalic platin for about uh, six to twelve cycles. There are some other alkylating agents, carbazine, bicarbazine, bucarbazine, tibazolamide, bisulfane. Actually, I'm not going to go into the details as you can have the slides and um, uh, you can go over them and the clinical uses and the common side effects. Uh, mechanism of action of all of them are the same. Now we have uh, MCQ number four, and Dr. Ines can share the slide for the answer, please. Dr. Ennis. I think that's correct. We have 15 people responded because of paucity of time, so we need to close the polls quickly. 79 and 20. I think that's fine enough, I think. Enough. I think that's correct. Hemorrhagic cystitis. Whenever you use um, iphosphamide, you have to always add plasma um, in order to prevent hemorrhagic cystitis. Correct. I'm happy that most of the people are answering the questions correctly. Okay. Okay, now we move to the topisomerase 2 inhibitors. Topisomerase 2 inhibitors. Um, these are uh, basically uh, the medication which cut the double helix, double strain breakage. Actually, it cut the double helix from the two sides and produces the double strain breakage. So we have under the topisomerase two inhibitors two different uh, classes. One of them is the anthracycline, another one is the etoposide. Anthracycline, which are donorubicin, doxorubicin, idorubicin, and apirubicin, uh, their mechanism of action, their, the key mechanism of action is the topisomerase 2 inhibition, which cuts the double helix from the two sides and produces the double strain breakage, and also it produces free radicals uh, like superoxide, which is cytotoxic, and actually our body can uh, dispose of uh, superoxide by a mechanism uh, called superoxide dismutase. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created superoxide dismutase in our body to dispose of the superoxide and prevent us from the cytotoxicity of the superoxide. But unfortunately, superoxide dismutase is not present in ample amount in heart. And that's why the anthracycline can cause uh, significant cardiotoxicity and can cause heart failure. So donorubicin, doxorubicin, idorubicin, and apirubicin, these are uh, anthracyclines and they can cause cardiotoxicity. So these are used for a variety of indications and different doses. And if the drug is leaked out of the blood vessels, then it can cause extravasation. So you have to have the extravasation ready. And that's uh, really uh, an emergency. And uh, this uh, antidote, DMSO, or doxazoxin has to be used if it's available. And as anthracyclines are really kind of toxic, and there's a lifetime accumulative dose of the anthracycline, doxorubicin should not be exceeded more than 450 to 550 milligrams per meter square. And all other anthracycline, you can convert them to a doxorubicin, and that's what we do in the clinical practice. And we should not be using doxorubicin more than 450. Actually, in pediatrics, their cutoff is even lesser, like 300, 375 milligrams per meter square, because these patients, they tend to live longer, and the survivors of the pediatric uh, leukemia patient or pediatric malignancy patient, uh, their risk of having cardiotoxicity is increased when they live longer. But for that reason, the, the cumulative dose that can receive in the lifetime is, is lesser than the adults. One other thing that the anthracycline can cause the red discoloration of the urine, so we need to talk to the patient and educate them about it. Etoposide is also topisomerase 2 inhibitor. It has a variety of indications, and it also can cause myelosuppression. Ayurvamating is also one of the side effects of the etoposide. 
adenocticant is the top isomer is one inhibitor. It cut only one side of the double helix and produces single strand breakage, uh, typically used for colorectal rectal cancer and also used for the lung cancer and can cause diarrhea. There's two types of diarrhea that it can cause. It can cause um, uh, uh, acute diarrhea that's typically uh, cholinergic in nature, and you have to use atropine as an anticholinergic for prevention and treatment of diarrhea if it happens within 24 hours. If it is a late diarrhea that's due to mucositis, then we can use loperamide for that. Then we have the vein calculides, um, and we have vein pristine, vein blastin, and anodal vein. What happens actually in the metaphase, uh, the microtubular polymerization takes place. So vin pristine, vin blastin, and vin I mean, calculide, what they do, they try to inhibit the polymerization of the uh, microtubules, and hence what happens, the cell cycle that takes place in the, mitos in the mitosis space. Uh, these drugs are uh, excreted, uh, metabolized, and excreted through the liver. So in case of hepatic insufficiency, the doses of the drug have to be adjusted. Uh, vincristine is not myelosuppressive, but the vinblastin and venodal vein are myelosuppressive. Vincristine is much more near the toxic agent, and uh, uh, if accidentally, if it is given intra and not to give the vincristine in the small string, actually you have to prepare the dose in the piggy pack so that it's not confused with uh, uh, with the intrathecal chemotherapy. And neurological toxicity is quite common, and also it can cause constipation. Texans are pretty similar mechanism of action to when when calculated. But what they do instead of inhibiting the polymerization, what they do, they make stabilization of the polymerization. And the same thing happens. The cell cycle arrest takes place because uh, these progeny. Uh, chromatids go back to the different poles, and then uh, the anaphase, um, uh, sorry, the spindle fiber formation, uh, which is formed, it is uh, it is not. Right, so again, it's working the mitosis phase. So both platelet-axle, docetaxel, they are uh, can cause severe myelosuppression, and all of them, um, they are neurotoxic and can cause peripheral neuropathy. Then we have the anti-metabolites, uh, methotrexate and pamitrexate because of the paucity of time. Uh, we cannot go over all these anti-metabolites, and I have kept only the example of the methotrexate here. So for methotrexate, it is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, and it in the, uh, the conversion of uh, folic acid, which is dihydrofolic acid that is present in our food, and it prevents the, form the conversion of the dihydrofolic acid, tetrahydrofolic acid, which is the active form of the folinic acid. And, um, and for that reason, we have to provide patients with a leukovore and a folinic acid, which is uh, antidote of the methotrexate, 24 hours after the exposure of the methotrexate. And uh, it can cause leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, it can cause renal failure. So we have to alkalinize the patient. Alopecia. And uh, typically, we use high dose methotrexate in hematological malignancies and CNS lymphoma, uh, which is defined as any dose above 0.5 gram, and we can use up to 12 gram in osteosarcoma. And of course, we have to provide hydration, like below 0.05. Those patients who have third spacing fluids, such as ascites, blood refusion, these are the contraindication for the high dose methotrexate because high dose methotrexate can stay uh, in this third space and it leaks back into the circulation and its excretion is delayed and that results in significant toxicities. So uh, this is the managing uh, uh, principles of the high dose methotrexate. You have to maintain very good urine output with hydration plus minus furosemide. You have to do the urinary alkalinization. You keep the urine pH above 7.5 by using the sodium bicarbonate in combination with um, uh, IV fluids, such as dextrose 5%. We monitor the serum creatinine on daily basis and electrol electrolytes. We also give the potassium because the sodium bicarbonate can shift the potassium to the uh, uh, intracellular compartment. We keep monitoring the metatrixate level until the metatrixate level is less than 0.05, or at least less than 
one. And uh, some patients uh, who may have uh, uh, very high levels of the methotrexate level, and they have like kidney function deteriorating, so they may be candidate for the glucagonate, which can oxidize or, uh, or uh, detoxify like 97.5% of the methotrexate within 15 minutes. But this drug is not cost effective. One dose is costing around 250 to 500,000 reals. Uh, per dose. Uh, so we have done a study in 500 doses and we have uh, um, found only two patients actually quite the modalysis and that was reversible. You have to avoid some medication with the high dose methotrexate because they can increase the, they can uh, delay the excretion of the methotrexate with penicillin, omeprazole, salicylate, sulfonamide, and that's the last question that we have on our screen. Which one of the following medication is known to cause cardiotoxicity in the cancer patient? Remember, which medication I was focusing on that can, uh, Dr. Ines, if you can share the screen. You remember, like I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that there is a group of medication which can produce superoxide and uh, superoxide. Um, uh, Dr. Ines, please share the screen to answer yeah, this. Okay. So you remember, like uh, I was mentioning, okay. there's a group of, there's a group of, uh, uh, there's a class of compound uh, which can cause superoxide produce superoxide, and these superoxide, no, the next question, next, next. Question yeah, this, the last one, right? The last one. Yeah. So that can, that can uh, cause cardiotoxicity because superoxide dismutases are not present in the heart in ample amounts. No, next question, next. Okay. Yeah, this question. Yes, that's good. Good, good. We're running out of time, so I think we can close the poll in order to be with the time. I think one minute overdue. So I think that's correct, Dr. Ines. We can close the poll. So most of the people have voted for doxorubicin, which is anthracycline, and that can cause cardiotoxin. And with that, I would like to say thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Ines. I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Any question for Dr. Mansour? I think it's at the end of the session. Oh, it's fine. I, I can answer the question now. That's good. Okay. Okay, in the end of the session. Dr. Mansour, you are mute. Can you unmute yourself? And they, uh... Yeah, I mean, if... So they can ask you. If somebody can ask you a question, it will be done because I'm busy today, moving my, uh, shifting my accommodation. So uh, if I, somebody can ask me a question, I'll be done. Yani. That, that's very good for me. Please uh, write your question for Dr. Mansour. You can unmute yourself and you can ask this Dr. Mansour if you want. I they think there is one question. There is one question. Yeah. And what is tumor antibiotics? So antitumor antibiotics like oxorubicin, anthracycline is one of the uh, antitumor antibiotic. Uh, bluomycin is one of the antitumor antibiotic. Anthracycline that we talked about, oxorubicin, hydrobicin. Mitosendron is also similar to intracycline. Uh, Epirubicin, these are basically anti-tumor antibiotics which is used for a variety of malignancies. Somebody was asking this question, what is anti-tumor antibiotics? Uh, there's a question, uh, how to calculate the carboplatin, doctor? Carboplatin, we use Calvert formula. I think Dr. Innes and SOPA administration uh, will share with you our slides. So we use a formula called Calvert formula. In Calvert formula, we use AUC uh, plus uh, AUC plus uh, uh, 
creatinine clearance uh, plus GFR, and you have to multiply this with the AUC, and that's the call Calvit formula. There is another question, uh, another to you, Mother Delta, cancer. I cannot understand this question. Is there another equation for Calvit calculation? Yeah, Calvit formula. Uh, is also called anti-tope isomerase. I did not understand this question. So we have tope isomerase one inhibitor like idenotecane, and we have tope isomerase two inhibitors such as uh, to, uh, such as um, uh, and anthracycline. Did drug interaction with uh, cotrimoxazole and methotrexate? Yes, because cotrimoxazole has uh, trimethoprim and methotrexate. They share the same mechanism of action, uh, dihydrofolate reductase. And uh, that's why uh, they are not recommended to be combined together, and that increases the toxicity of uh, methotrexate. Doctor, uh, there is a question from YouTube. What is the management of hemorrhagic cystitis if happened? Yeah. So if hemorrhagic cystitis happens, so what we do basically, we continue uh, mesna and we continue the IV fluids. And if it is really aggressive, then sometimes we use also the bladder irrigation with the mesna. Bladder irrigation with the mesna. Mesna is mercaptoic head, sulfonate sodium. Okay. Uh, there is another question from YouTube also. Mm -hmm. Is the toxicity of uh, anthracycline in, in the heart reversible or irreversible? And we can overcome it? it, it no, the cardiotoxicity of the anthracycline is irreversible. So what happens, basically, there is different types of cardiotoxicity. If I talk about cardiotoxicity, it will take four or five hours for me to talk about the cardiotoxicity of anthracycline. There is um, early onset. Uh, there is acute toxicity, which is like arrhythmias. That could be reversible, that comes and goes, uh, acute, uh, acute toxicity. There's early onset toxicities which can happen within a year, and that is usually cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, ventricular tachycardia, and these kind of toxicities are not reversible. And uh, there is late onset, which can happen even five, 10 years, so these are not reversible. So if they develop congestive heart failure, you have to uh, provide the heart failure therapy like you treat any other heart failure patient. Any other question? So somebody is asking how to use methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. For rheumatoid arthritis, we use smaller doses of methotrexate, like weekly on weekly basis. But for leukemia and lymphoma, we use higher doses. Dr. Ines, is there any other question? Uh, there is a question. Uh, what is the effect of uh, combination of leukemia treatment? Um... Okay, for leukemia, leukemia is basically two main types, uh, acute leukemia and chronic leukemia. And acute leukemia is mainly two types, acute myeloid leukemia, acute uh, lymphoid leukemia. And there is hundreds of types of AML and ALL, actually. And so what we do, basically, the combination therapy, we use intensive chemotherapy, uh, plus minus target therapy in order to achieve complete remission. The complete remission, uh, which is um, uh, defined as like the abnormal cells, blast cells should be less than 5% in the bone marrow. The normal uh, blood, blood cells should uh, should uh, be normalized. For example, the CBC should be normalized. Like, for example, neutrophils should be more than 1,000, but it should be more than 100,000. There should be no extra medullary disease. And uh, like this. So, so with the induction chemotherapy, which is a combination of at least uh, four drugs or four plus more drugs, we achieve the complete remission. And in consolidation, we use also similar to three to four drug combination in order to consolidate uh, the remission state. And also in the maintenance, we use low dose chemotherapy in order to uh, prevent the cancer coming back. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mansour. Thanks Thank a lot for this very informative session. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. So far as I can leave then, huh? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good luck for the whole uh, course. Thank you so much. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Okay.